ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. I wouldn't imagine anyone thinks you're going to win. <laughs> and it's fair enough. Cronulla coach Craig Fitzgibbon saying the quiet part out loud ahead of the clash with Penrith. It feels like the theme for his Sharks this week is the old nobody believes in us. And, hey, it might make Cronulla fans feel good to know they are not alone on that front. The Roosters are also heavy outsiders against the Storm. Sometimes, though, consensus can be the surest indication that an upset is coming. Today, we are trying to wonder how the Sharks and Chooks might engineer the unthinkable. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily. Nick Captain is the ABC Sport NRL scribe. He's here to pull apart two enormous preliminary finals. Campo, I want to dig into the lack of belief in the Roosters and Sharks and how they might maybe somehow spring an upset. And we're going to start with the Storm hosting the Roosters and Chooks captain James Tedesco. I mean, utterly brilliant against Manly. And this postseason, he has bristled at talk of a premiership window that's closing. How central will his battle be with Melbourne number one Ryan Pappenhausen to the outcome of this game? I think it'll be enormous, Staggy. I think if the Roosters are to have any chance of toppling the storm, they need Tedesco to really hit top form. But I guess the good thing for them is he has been in great form this whole season, really. Watson, short side left to Carey. Oh, brilliant ball, Tedesco! Then away, Tupo! Sends it in field, Tedesco's over! What a brilliant try! What about that second last pass? James Tedesco in game number 250 is able to score for the Roosters. You know, there was a bit of talk last year that maybe Tedesco had gone past a certain point. Maybe he was sort of on the back end of his of his career and he couldn't quite be the, 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 the star that he's been in the past. But he's really put those doubts to bed this season. I thought he was exceptional against Manly and proved that He's still very much one of the best fullbacks in the league. A little handoff back to Tupanua to Watson. Watson straight past Paseca. Goes left to Tedesco. And James Tedesco! Bing, bing, bing! The human pinball cuts through to score his second. It's been a bit of a year for Ryan Pappenhausen where he's gone through a similar thing. You know, there were probably question marks about what sort of impact he could have after all those injuries that he's had in the past few seasons. I think Pappenhausen has... Uh, done a fine job in sort of uh, fitting into this Storm team. I don't think they're asking him to do anything he's not capable of. He's maybe not as explosive as he was before all those knee and ankle uh, injuries, but certainly playing his role. I, I think Pappenhausen just has to play his part for Melbourne to win this game, but I think we need a bit of a Tedesco special if the Roosters end up being with a chance. And I think a lot of their chances to score points and to win this game will come off what he does well. Jared Waria Hargraves. You've written about him being kind of the last of his kind. When you're playing a team that is as solid as the Storm, you've got to find a way to disrupt. Do you think this enforcer can inflict the damage that might do just that? Well, when I look at that Melbourne forward pack, I think of that word you just use. I think of solid. You know, they have Josh King, they have Trent Loyero, they have a lot of guys who are very, very solid, very capable of what they do. But outside of Nelson and Sofa Solomona, there's not a whole lot of uh, players who have that glint in their eye, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, it's going to be a penalty. That shoulder charge from Solomon, uh, Nelson and Sofa Solomona, that's going to be a penalty to Penrith. Uh, and Warrior Hargraves sometimes has too much glint in his eye. <laughs> but I think that's the way that the Roosters can get out the storm a little bit. If Warrior Hargraves can set the tone physically, the way that he loves to do, the way that he has for so many years now. If he can get Melbourne off their game a little bit, if he can get the Roosters on top in the middle of the field, that'll go a really long way because up the middle is where the Roosters can get the storm. You know, And not just with Hargraves, but with Lindsay Collins and Spencer Lenu and Terrell May. And then you get the fast guys like Tedesco, like Manu, like Watson, all working off the back of that. That's the Roosters' best avenue for victory, but it is really going to start with Warrior Hargraves. And I think he's got to set the tone in the middle of the field by fair means or foul. And we know he doesn't mind going foul sometimes. Jarrett's oh. in the bin. It was a tackle on Sam Beryls, which I did think to myself, well, wow, they've got him over there on that, uh, that western side. And now Hargreaves is on his way off. So Warrior Hargreaves on return from a four-game suspension. He hasn't played since 
his milestone game becoming the, the most highly capped rooster against the Dragons. They'll rely on him very, very heavily to sort of lead the way in that regard. Warrior Hargraves is one part of that last dance narrative. The other parts are Suali, Manu and Kiri. Out of those departing chooks who can break a game open, if you had to zero in one that might destabilise Melbourne, who do you think it might be? You know, I actually think it's Luke Kiri. I think Suali'i and Manu, as good players as they are, I think they've got to be part of that yardage attack up the middle of the field. You know, we know how good Suali'i is with that. Like, if you think about his kick returns when he plays on the wing or he plays at fullback, I still think that's the biggest strength of his game. You know, we think about Manu getting turned inside and sort of dancing across defenders and creating space. I think that's going to be their job in this one. But... They get, the Roosters are going to have to create some points at some stage, and I think Kiri is one of the most likely to do that. Smith goes left to Kiri, puts the high kick up towards this Norwestern corner. Leiluti can't deal with it and ends up with Tupanua, puts it on the toe. Kiri flying through. He gets a round of applause from Matthew Elliott. You know, you think about those blindside rushes that he's so good at and has been so good at for so long. You know, I, I can imagine the Roosters keeping things really tight, really up the middle of the field. But if there's a chance down a short side for Kiri to link with Tedesco or maybe throw a nice face ball to Dom Young or something like that, I think that is how that they can break through this very, very staunch Melbourne Storm defence. So I'm expecting Kiri to play a massive role in any sort of uh, attacking raids that the Chooks might have. If a Storm loss seems unlikely, it's even less likely for the Panthers to go down to the Sharks, you'd say. And it's getting even harder for Cronulla with a big injury cloud hovering over their centres pairing. Just, just how bad is that looking right now? I think that's pretty massive. Jesse Ramian's been sort of struggling with a foot injury for a couple of weeks now. He's been uh, in a moon boot before and after games. I don't think he's trained much recently. Got Jesse, how Jesse got through was remarkable. He's, um, yeah, he's a special player. He's a tough kid to get through that. The Sharks have one quite good centre replacement in Sia Sifatalakai. You know, we're all very familiar with the sort of damaging attacking runs that he can provide at this point. And he's about as good a backup as you could ask for uh, in, in, in the centres. But if Kyle Eero is unable to play, then all of a sudden the Sharks are kind of getting stressed to breaking point. I don't really think that there's a standout replacement to come in for him. I think they'd be looking at someone who spent most of the season in reserve grade. And the thing with the Sharks is I think they're a very well-rounded football side. I think it's hard to sort of pinpoint who their best player is at any given time. I think they're very sort of deep from one to seven. And that's a good way to be. But then if you lose one cog in the machine, all of a sudden the rest of it might not run as well. So the Sharks were already up against it. But if they're without both their centers going up against Penrith, we're kind of getting to miracle territory at that point. Let's try and paint some kind of picture of a miracle with some positives. Braden Trindle seems to be sort of having this coming of age finals series. Or it could be. Week two, we saw it. Last. Braley goes right, Trindle the kick under no pressure from 28 out, down to the wing of Tuolangi, through comes Katoa, Tuolangi loses it, still six, uh, still play on, oh. as Trindle is backing up Raymond and he's over in the corner. There were too many Sharks and the Cowboys went night Could he be poised for one of those legendary finals runs where a player kind of announces themselves as properly arriving? I think so, yeah. I was so impressed with how he played against the Cowboys and it wasn't just that he was sort of taking on the more dominant play rate, playmaker role. It was the fact that there was so much pressure on the Sharks. You know, all the talk all week was about their poor finals record under Craig Fitzgibbon, how they'd failed to play their best football when it counted. And the knives were well and truly out for any player. It would, that, that would be a lot to carry. But Trindle took it upon himself to sort of lead the way for his side, you know, and if we look at it uh, from the different perspective for this week, all the pressure's off the Sharks now. You know, they've got that finals win. They're going into a game that a lot of people don't give them a chance. They're going to be freed up to, to, to play some of their best footy. You know, there's all, all, the, all the pressure is on the other side. All the expectation is on the other side. And if Braden Trindle can play that well under pressure, imagine what he can do when he's freed up like that, you know? So I'm expecting a, a, another big game from him. I'm expecting a big game from... Nico Hines as well. He's someone who, you know, pressure's been a bit of a watchword for him through this season, but he's not going to get a better shot at the stumps than uh, than this one. So those two will have to have big games, and they'll have to have big games in conjunction with one another. They'll have to work together a lot if the Sharks are to pull this one off. The Panthers forwards are just so formidable. Fisher, Harris, Leota, Yo, those middles are tough. What can the Sharks do to break that cartel of muscle? 
I think they've got to wear the first punch. Penrith, in these big games, have made a habit of starting really, really well to the point where there have been games where things have looked over after about 20 minutes. When the Panthers played the Roosters the other week, they came out and they blew them off the park, and after 10 minutes, it felt like the Roosters were, were already up against Kenny, it. short side left again. It comes away to Luke Garner. Luke Garner, he's over. Can he get it down? I'll tell a man he did. That's the Panthers' fourth. They are running a mark. It's men against boys. The Sharks don't have to dominate the middle of the field in that opening 20. They don't even have to get any points on the board. They just have to limit the impact that Penrith's middles do have. And then say Liotta and Fisher-Harris come off and it's only 6-0 or 4-0 or something like that, then I think the Sharks will feel really good about themselves. But they have to wear that first punch. You know, they have to be able to get back up off the canvas and, and keep fighting. If they can do that, a lot of things can happen for them. But they have to bite down on the mouth guard early. Campo, you're a dreamer. You're also a realist. After all of that... Who's playing in the grand final? Well, it's hard to go past the Storm and the Panthers, isn't it? I think I give the Roosters a bit more of a chance at an upset than I do the Sharks. But I think the Storm really have that uh, that premiership look about them at the minute. And Penrith have just sort of turned their performances at this time of year into something of a fine art. So I'm expecting the Storm to work hard against the Roosters but get through. Expecting Penrith to maybe put a bit of a score on the Sharks. But... Uh, yeah, I think, I think we're bound for Storm Penrith next week. Nick Campton, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. No worries. Thanks, Daggy. Headlines, AFL. And at the time of publish, we are still waiting on the teams for the AFL Grand Final. The Swans seem certain to go in unchanged after ruling out Cal Mills yesterday. The only real question is Logan McDonald, but everything we're hearing suggests he's over that ankle concern. As for the Lions, they have already confirmed Darcy Fort will replace the injured ruck Oscar McInerney. So it seems unlikely we're going to get any inverted commas bombshells. But to be sure, check the ABC website, abc.net.au slash sport the team is on fire there. There are features galore on both teams. And Cody Atkinson's done a really cool analytical breakdown on the big game for all you nerds out there, of which I am one. Oh, and check out the AFL Grand Final parade coverage on the ABC Listen app too. Hoops and Caitlin Clark's first season in the WNBA has come to a close with her Indiana Fever out of the playoffs after losing to Connecticut. Clark had 25 points and nine assists in the six-point loss. The rookie has absolutely electrified the women's hoops league, but there is obviously still a long way to go before she's contending for a title at Indiana Rugby. And the Wallabies have made just one unforced change to the team that was narrowly beaten by the All Blacks in Sydney. Halfback Nick White has been dropped for Jake Gordon. As the Australians prepare to take on the Kiwis in Wellington, they haven't won in NZ since 2001. John Howe was still in the lodge. Hey, he was still wearing Wallabies trackies. In cycling, Australia has claimed a gold medal in the team time trial at the World Champs in Switzerland. The Australian team was Grace Brown, Brody Chapman, Jay Vine, Michael Matthews, Ben O'Connor and Ruby Roseman Gannon. It's Brown's second gold of the meet. She will aim for a third over the weekend in the final race of her career in the women's road race. And in the netball, the Diamonds have avoided unwanted history, claiming the third match of their series against the English 69-56. The Aussie team has never lost a series to England on home soil. They now turn their attention to next month's Constellation Cup against New Zealand. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily, produced by Poppy Penny. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.